If you've run 210 or even 208 or 205 and you want to run 155, then there needs to be a change that happens. And I'm telling you that the change doesn't necessarily need to be a change in your muscles or in your heart or in your mitochondria or in your lactate threshold. No, the change comes in here. It starts in here. Welcome. I'm just going to start uh, over here. So what we're talking about today is a little story that I want to share with you from anybody who's been up into the Boston area before. I used to live there. I grew up there. And every year we would go on a field trip to either the New England Aquarium or we would go to the Museum of Science. And uh, Museum of Science was always interesting because they had different displays that kept changing. Now I went back there about 10, it was exactly 10 years ago, I went back there and they had this really cool uh, exhibit on time. And I'm going to share with you something that I learned there that I didn't even realize what the lesson was until recently. And then we're going to apply this to your running. I'm going to show you exactly why this is. Now, they had this really cool experiment. It was a whole room on time and you get to learn all kinds of things. And one of them was a booth that you could go into and it was like a sensory deprivation booth. It was all black. You close the curtain, you put on earmuffs and you're not supposed to have any input, no phone, there's no clock in there. And all there is is a screen and there's a button, a big red button that you hit. Now, when you hit the button, it starts a timer and you can't see a timer. You don't see anything, it's just a black screen. You start the timer and you close your eyes and they challenge you to estimate how long one minute is. Now, I stood in line for this thing and I watched person after person get really low times. So they would hit it and they would wait and they would wait and they would wait and then they'd hit it again and it was it was like, you know, 27 seconds. And I think the closest anybody got was maybe like 50 seconds or something like that. Most people, they dramatically uh, overestimated how much time had gone by, virtually everybody. And then uh, my girlfriend went at the time and she got, you know, relatively close, but not much closer than anybody else. And then it was my turn. And I just really felt like I could do this, but I had no idea how I was going to do it. I knew that if I tried to count, they encourage you not to count. Okay. Cause that all that does is tell you, can you count on tempo? Not, can you estimate time? You're supposed to try to estimate time, uh, with just how it feels. And I knew that the way to do this was to use my emotion. So what I did was I got in the booth and I decided what I was going to do was I was going to close my eyes and I was going to put myself in my mind back to my high school track. And the high school track was important because on that high school track, if any of you ran track in high school, not even college, especially high school, if you played any sport in high school, you probably remember that it's really dramatic. It's like every game, every meet is life or death. You know, it really matters and there's crying and there's tears and there's, uh, there's emotion. There's a lot of it. Okay. And there was definitely that back in track, it, uh, back in high school track was, was, uh, it was life or death. Every meet was, it was all on the line. So there was every training and every race, there was a lot of just of, of adrenaline and fear and pleasure and, uh, everything. Right. So what I did was I visioned myself in this booth running a 400 meters on the track in 60 seconds. Now it turned out my best time was 60 seconds and um, at the time. And so I knew exactly what it felt like to run as hard as I could for 60 seconds on the track. So I hit the button and I imagined myself on my high school track because the high school one had all those emotions. Every 100 meters, every checkpoint, I could see the barn and I could see the cows in the distance and I could see the fence and every little divot in the track because I ran on this thing for four years, right? And I, I brought myself around in my mind to the 200 meters and I brought myself around coming up onto the home stretch and I felt in my body what it was like to have my heart going like this and to have the people in the stands and uh, to just be going as hard as I could and to press forward and press forward and I saw 50 meters to go and I saw the finish line and I waited until I was gonna cross the finish line and then boom, I clicked the button and my time I'm very proud to say it was 60 seconds flat in the, uh, in the Museum of Science, trying to estimate my time. So why in that moment was, was I able to estimate time when I, in another scenario, if I didn't use that emotion, I wouldn't have been able to do it. 
And the reason is because uh, every, every aspect of running around 400 meters was tied intricately to how I felt. Okay. So have you ever had the experience maybe studying for an exam or something in college or high school where the, it mattered where you studied. So if you studied in your, uh, in a, in a room at home with music on and you didn't have your music when you went in the background to, when you took your test, you did worse. Or if you were sitting in a desk studying in class, when you sat at the same desk, you would really, you would have a better result, a better test score than if you sat elsewhere or went into a different room. So when you can recreate the environment that you practiced in your test or in your race, you're going to produce a similar result. So I'm going to ask you guys a couple of questions here, and I'm going to share with you an excerpt uh, that I took from a book here just today. Okay. So here's a couple of questions for you and go ahead. And if you can come up with the answers to these on the spot, I challenge you to type of, type them into the, uh, the box and then I can get back to them here. Okay. Question number one is knowing that emotion is tied to your memory. Meaning that if you, okay, before we do this, can you remember where you were on 9-11? I don't even need to say the year, right? I just say 9-11 and you know I'm talking about 2001. Can you remember where you were, or what you were doing? The answer is probably for most people, the answer is Yes. But can you remember where you were on June 11th of that year? Can you remember where you were on June 11th of this year? The answer is likely not, unless something important was going on on June 11th. Now, the reason you can remember exactly where you were, maybe even what you were wearing, who was there on 9-11, is because there was a motion tied to that moment. And so now just thinking about it, it's really easy to recall it, and it's really easy to even tap back into those emotions. So we tend to remember things better when there's an emotional impact when we learn about it. Okay. Now, how does this relate to your running? So here's a couple of questions for you that we're going to be able to figure that out a little bit. So what emotion first do you need to have in your race, your upcoming race in order to run a personal best? What emotion do you need to have? Now it could be for different people, this is different things. A lot of people are going to feel a positive emotion. They want to feel like they can get something. Like I feel joy. I feel like there's potential. I feel like I'm growing. I feel like it's exciting. And for other people, it's, oh shit, there's somebody who's going to catch me. I'm in first place or I'm in first place in my age group. And I know that that other man or woman in my age group is just 10 seconds behind me. And there's fear. You ever have that fear in a race where you're kind of being hunted and that pushes you to go harder, right? When you get into the lead of a race, or even uh, just ahead of someone who you want to beat and you feel that they're behind you, it really does give you fear that pushes you forward. Or you can see someone who's in front of you and have a desire. It's not fear anymore that's driving you. It's desire to catch them. And those are different emotions, right? And they drive you in different ways. Sometimes it's the desire to achieve. Sometimes it's the fear of being caught. Sometimes it's the fear of not breaking 25 minutes in our 5k or sometimes it's the it's the excitement of, of oh my god I'm gonna smash 25 minutes in my 5k or 17 minutes in my 5k whatever it is for you okay I want you to think about what emotion do you need in order to be that kind of runner who ha- let's say you want to break two hours in the half marathon that's very common a lot of you guys in this group want to do that so had you already broken two hours in the half marathon you You wouldn't need to change anything. You would have a belief that you could do it. The belief is certain because you've already run a 150. No problem. Unless you like sprain your ankle. But if you've run 210 or even 208 or 205 and you want to run 155, then there needs to be a change that happens. And I'm telling you that the change doesn't necessarily need to be a change in your muscles or in your heart, or in your mitochondria, or in your lactate threshold. No, the change comes in here. It starts in here. And so the version of yourself who runs a 155 half marathon in the, ver- in the future, and the version who exists now who runs a 210, they're different versions of you. They're not the same person. So you have to become, in your mind, you have to become 
the version of yourself who's already done it, who believes that it can be done. Because if you don't believe it can be done, you won't go for it even, or you'll sabotage it. You'll think you went out too fast and you'll have to slow down. So what emotion, I'll ask this one more time here. What emotion do you need to feel in order to be absolutely certain that you're going to hit your PR in your race? Okay, that's number one. Then after you know that, number two is what emotion, what emotional state do you have right now? And they, they're not going to be the same. They can't be the same because if they were exactly the same, you would already have done it. So there's a gap that exists. And if you know what you want, and if you know where you are, very honestly, and it's hard to be honest here because sometimes we, uh, we either get hard on ourselves and think it's hard, like it's hopeless, I'm hurt, I have this injury, or I'm, I missed my long runs, or I'm sick, or the weather's bad. And you, if you do that, then you make it worse. And sometimes you can overinflate yourself and think, oh yeah, it's no problem. You can lie to yourself and say, oh yeah, no problem. I'm gonna run 145 it, no, and it's gonna be easy and I feel fast and I feel free. But part of your mind doesn't really believe it. And if you don't believe it, it doesn't matter. So you have to, you have to sh- maybe shoot a little higher and shoot a little, a little bit lower and find it where it is that you actually believe you are right now. It's very important that you get clear on that and, and we don't lie to ourselves. Make it better or make it worse. It's, got, it's just, just what is, and it's okay. If you know that, then you compare the two, okay? The more important question is, what do you need to feel? That was that first question. Now, when you identify that, how can you bridge that gap? Now, you can bridge it by running. You can bridge it by training, but I'm going to show you this really cool image here that I just love that I found today, and that's this one. No, oh, nope, not that one. It's this one. So uh, in, this, in the book, Atomic Habits, see if I can move it out of the way here. Here we go. I'm going to move it over here, actually. That's easier. Okay, so in Atomic Habits, there is uh, this little graph. And look at this. It's very interesting. So look at the straight line. That is, uh, is what you think your training should do. This is what you think you should do in, uh, you, you know, I'm running 10 miles for my long run, then 12 and then 14, and then 16, and you think that you should be able to achieve really high. Now, if you incrementally improve your training and you go into a tune-up race, and the tune-up race doesn't go the way you want, maybe you're a little bit faster, but not a lot faster. That's that straight line. That's you put in some work and you think you should get better. You put in some work and you think you should get better. It's linear. Now look at the curved line. The curved line is what actually is going to happen when you are fully invested for the long term. This is not short term, okay? So watch that, that curve. At the beginning, you're not, you may not get the result that you want. You're below it. You're underperforming for a long time, for maybe a really long time, for weeks, because you go back to the basics and you start building your base training. So if you go do a, tuna, a 5K, it's going to be slower because you're not focusing on 5K speed. You're going to be underperforming. And then you go into your support training, and you spend another month and a half there and you do a tune-up race, maybe a half marathon and you run slower than you did the year before. And so you think that all this training is sucking and you're not going to get anywhere. So you're underneath that curve. Look at what you think is going to happen is that straight line and you're underneath. So now watch what happens. You're underperforming, you're underperforming, and then you start with your specific training. Now your specific training is going to be about a month and a half and maybe a month and three quarter maybe two months if you're going to taper for a long time. And what that does is that takes all of your fitness and it stacks it on top of everything that you've built. And now look what happens to this curve. It shoots upwards. It's not linear. So it's like compounded compounded interest in your bank account, right? It's like, it doesn't make a difference. 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. It's like, it doesn't make a difference until it builds off itself to a critical point where your interest skyrockets and you can live off of your interest alone and never touch your principal. It's a great concept, but in order for compounding interest in your bank to work, you have to start investing years, decades, many decades. This is why we're told to start investing when we're 15, you know? It's not because we need to accrue the money, it's because we need time for interest to compound. It's the same thing with your training. So you put in the months and the months and the months of dedicated training, and you may even underperform. A lot of you are actually going to see that you will overperform because you're going to address things that you didn't before. But even for world-class athletes, this is what they're going to see. It's going to be like they're kind of, they're in okay shape, but not that great. Okay shape, not that great. And then 
when you get to your specific phase, you you just blast through the ceiling. And this is what we've seen with even with several of you guys in this group right now. Um, there's a there's a couple of you that I've already highlighted, so I won't uh, keep dropping your names here, but uh, I might just because I'm so proud of you guys. Um, there's a couple of you who have taken. 10, 10 minutes off of a half marathon and 20 minutes off of a marathon, boom, like that. And how did you do that? You you didn't do tune-up races. That, I'm going to just call you out Maryland, especially. Um, you took over 20 minutes off of your marathon, right? And it wasn't because you did all these tune-up races and got better and better and better. It was actually a build-up and then whoosh, on race day, you just smashed it because you built your high, because you built your uh, your your uh, pyramid, right? So if you guys haven't watched my webinar, um, I can put it in the comments here. I think a lot of you guys have, but this is a free training. You guys just go in there. I'm going to just type it. I can type it here. Um, it's uh, bit.ly slash run elite free training. Boom. You can go right there and we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about how to structure your training. If you guys want uh, specific one-on-one help, then you can reach out to me, PM, and I'll, I'll let you know what it's like to work together to get coaching. But um, I digress for now. That's a free training that I want you to just go and watch if you haven't. And I'm going to tell you exactly how to structure your training so that you can lead to that peak that leads to that exponential curve. And that's what I wanted to share with you guys today. So let's go back now to recap and, and conclude here. Let's go back to the beginning of this when I was talking about the time and estimating one minute. Why was I able to hit a button, close my eyes, and visualize running around a track and feel how hard it was, how difficult, and and see every little moment, and then boom, click it and get exact exactly 60 seconds on that clock at the Museum of Science in Boston. Why could I do that? It wasn't because I'm good at estimating time. Lord knows I'm, I'm definitely not. But I'm good at tapping into the emotion of something that's important to me, running is very important to me, and it was back then. So with you, when you are going to toe the line for your race, what's going to happen is that you're going to race under the emotion that you've been thinking about for the entire time that you've been training. So if you're thinking that it's going to be hard, or you might not be able to do it, or if you're worried about getting injured, or if you're worried about this, then that's going to come out in your race, and you're going to race appropriately. You're going to, it's going to match up you're never really going to surprise yourself. The only way, you're never going to surprise yourself, good or bad. It kind of works out the way you you really think. Even if you don't say it, it's always like, oh yeah, I knew I was going to suck today. Or yeah, I kind of felt like I was in really good shape. You always kind of know. And so whatever you know to be true is going to be what you're going to reap in your race. So why not make it something beautiful, make it something good? Why not rehearse in training the emotion that you want to feel on race day over here. Because remember, there's a gap from where you are to where you want to go, and we have to bridge that gap. They have to be they're going to be the same on race day. Why not make them the same good one instead of the same shitty one, okay? So, I encourage you guys to if you haven't typed it here, go ahead and type. A lot of you guys have typed where you are. I want you to go ahead and also consider typing where you want to go. And this isn't for me, this is for you. So, you can even write it down. I wrote down a couple here. Write it down in your journal, write it down on your refrigerator, put it in your phone, whatever it is, and so that you know where you're going, what you want to feel. And you know what? Your training will just kind of happen. It'll be easy. You'll know how to do it It, because when something hard comes along, a new kind of workout maybe that I tell you about or one of your friends tells you about, when that is presented to you, it's going to be cake. You're going to just do it or you're going to do it at a higher level because it feels good to do. Okay? So I'm going to take a second here and just um, see if I missed any comments here. I'm not sure if it'll let me see. I can't see all of them. It won't let me while I'm live. So I can just see a couple. Uh, Tony, you said that you were determined to accomplish a goal and you want to keep growing. You're determined. I remember you saying this on calls um, together, Tony. So what's fueling Tony here is, he's is he a towards or is he a, an away value guy? Is he trying to escape something that's chasing him or is he trying to run towards something that is desired? So when you're determined to accomplish a goal, that is, Attainment of a goal is what lights you up. And so he's moving towards something that is beautiful. And when you tap into that by imagining yourself running your race and being happy and hitting your goals, not just not just saying it or seeing it, but feeling it. Feeling is the key. When you feel yourself doing it on race day, then you start to bridge that gap. And you want to keep growing. Yes, by keep growing, 
Um, you're able to not just hit a goal and then hang your hat up and be like, I'm done. It's a, it's an acknowledgement that there's this, a, this is a continuous process that's going to last you a lifetime because you're never going to hit your marathon goal or your half marathon goal and then feel complete. You're really not. There's going to be another goal that happens after that. Um, so if I missed, uh, Andrew, you're the best. Thank you for this. So I can write it down how I'm going to smash my half this Saturday. You're welcome, Amber. Uh, yes, Amber, I know you have a, a half marathon coming up. Yes. On Saturday this weekend. So I'm rooting for you. Um, let us know where it is. I think it's maybe down in Alabama, but, uh, we're rooting for you in here. So if you guys have any questions on this, go ahead and, um, continue to type them. When I get out of here, I'll go check them. And if I missed something, I'll reply to you one-on-one. And if you haven't watched the free um, webinar training, go ahead and go to bit.ly slash run elite free training, all lowercase. You'll see it in the comments here. You can click that. You can register if you've already watched that webinar. Cause I do it frequently. Um, you guys have maybe already seen it. If you have, then don't worry about it. I want that's for those of you who haven't seen it yet, because right in the middle of it, um, about, um, about 55% of the way through it, I think I'm, I'm always going to talk about this structure, this pyramid structure, because we start with your mindset, then we talk about your structure, then we go back to the mindset that's really going to get it done, and you guys are going to get so much value from it, and, uh, and that's it. And uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you for being part of the group, and uh, boom, I will talk with you guys soon. boy with this girl here because she's adorable and she loves you (laughs) i try to give her a cameo anytime i can